Hi, I'm Alex Hafner. I'm an undergrad at Illinois State University, and this summer I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Bill Perry in his lab, learning more about ecosystem services and how Pennycrest performs them out in the field. So we know Pennycrest provides lots of beneficial ecosystem services, and the one I'm going to be focusing on today is decomposition. And this is when cover crop residues are left out in the field after harvest, and as those decompose, they release nutrients back into the soil. So in our lab, we're asking lots of questions about decomposition, specifically focusing on how it can be measured. It's important to quantify decomposition in other ecosystem services because that will help us calculate how effective Pennycress is as a cover crop compared to other cover crops. And we're also interested in how different genetic lines of Pennycress differ in terms of ecosystem services. And all these things will help us learn more about decomposition and how Pennycress is providing ecosystem services to the environment once it's commercialized. In order to quantify decomposition, we set up a study to track biomass loss and nitrogen loss over time. This involved taking mesh bags that are filled with pre-weighed amounts of biomass. Our treatment variable was the species of biomass, which included wild-type pennycress, annual rye, cereal rye, and the AOP2 gene-edited line of pennycress. AOP2 is responsible for glucosinolate production, which protects pennycress from herbivory and pathogens and these plants and usually contribute to overall plant fitness. So we predicted that this line would have faster decomposition than wild type pennycress. We started out by sampling every week but as time goes on decomposition slows so we spread out our sampling intervals to account for this. We had about 400 of these bags and we placed them in between rows of corn. All right now I'm gonna take you out to the field really fast and show you what this looks like. All right, so I'm in the middle of some very large corn to show you how we set up our decomposition experiment. We have five rows out in one field and then five in another. And each field has two different soil types that are representative of the soils in McLean County. In each of the rows, we have nine sampling points. And this is what one of those points looks like. It has four bags with each of the different species of biomass. There's pennycress, cereal rye, annual rye, and the AOP2 pennycress. And these nine different points, we come out at with a random sampling order and take one of them back per row. And each row is a replicate for our experiment. When we first put the bags out here, we put a scoop of soil on them to simulate incorporating them into the soil like normal crop residues. But we left them on top of the ground just because they would be easier to handle in doing a small scale decomposition experiment. So this will kind of be a conservative estimate of decomposition as opposed to having below ground biomass. We sealed them with a loop lock label that has a label on it so we can identify them and anchored them to the ground with these bamboo skewers until it's time to take them back to the lab. We've been collecting data for about five weeks now and right now we have biomass loss data up until day 28 and this graph here shows percent biomass remaining decreasing over time. And we were actually surprised to find out that AOP2 pennycress had the slowest rate of decomposition, followed by wild-type pennycress, cereal rye, and then annual rye actually ended up having the fastest rate of decomposition early on. We'll continue collecting this data up until October, and then once the nitrogen analysis instrument is available to us, we'll, continue, we'll start collecting that data. Once we complete our data collection, our statistical analysis will involve using nonlinear regression to calculate the rate of decomposition for both biomass loss and end loss over time, and that will be calculating the K value, which will tell us how much biomass or nitrogen is being lost per day during these trials. There could be multiple reasons that rye is decomposing early on, one being that it's a well-known nitrogen scavenger and it could be decomposing faster due to its higher nitrogen ratio. And pennycress is also very high in lignin, which decomposes slowly, so this could just mean that it's going to release its nutrients more steadily over a greater period of time. Decomposition studies are helpful for understanding ecosystem services more specifically, and this is good as pennycress approaches its commercialization. We'll be able to have data that suggests it's a good ecosystem service provider, and it will help us and farmers make decisions on how much fertilizer they're applying to their cash crops, which will reduce nutrient runoff into aquatic ecosystems. We'll continue with our data collection into the fall, and by then we'll be able to determine the rate of decomposition for our biomass spanning the entire cash crop growing period. 
And with this data and what we've learned during the experiment, we'll be able to make recommendations for large-scale decomposition studies in the future. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk at this year's annual meeting. If you have any questions, I'll be participating on the internship panel on day two of the meeting. Thank you.